Hi, I'm Siobhan, one of the journalists up at Manx Radio. Welcome to the latest edition of our newscast. Now, recently, a site at Eristane and Scard has been confirmed as Manx Utilities' preferred place for a wind farm on island. It was one of two sites being considered to meet government's commitment to developing an onshore wind farm by 2026. Although it's still not definite, it means plans for the development can progress to the next stage, the Environment Impact Assessment and Design stage follows a recommendation to progress the site initially. So why did the Manx Utilities Board decide to progress this site to that environmental impact assessment and design stage over the other options? And what can residents in the area expect to see going forward? I sat down with Manx Utilities Transition Programme Manager Lizzie Riley to find out. When that strategy was launched, we had a few different sites that were up for debate about where it was going to be based. And now we've settled on Iris Dane and Scards. Why that site in particular? Um, so if we start with the first site that got ruled out, which was the Baldwin and Ingebrek site, um, space-wise, um, that site did not have enough viable places where we could actually install turbines. So the maximum size of turbine we could accommodate limited the total size of that wind farm to three megawatts, which is obviously far below the target that we're trying to achieve. So we then had some further information that came through for both of the remaining two sites. And they were primarily about the transportation of the wind turbines to those sites. So particularly Solby and Druidale, the the transport is the real issue with that site. We can get very small turbines to that site, but that means then you need a lot of them there. And if you need a lot of them, the ecological damage from them is much uh, greater than what we'd see with a few turbines installed. The other issue is that even to get those smaller turbines to that site, we would have to widen um, a stretch of road, which is about four kilometres long. So if you think of the impact of that additional infrastructure being built at that site, inevitably it's going to have an environmental cost. So we on our team and our board did not believe that site was deliverable anymore. And the the real benefit of not having to do all of that is that there is significant cost saving. So that in the viable options that are available for Solby, the cost was estimated to be just under £38 million, whereas the Druidale site was significantly lower cost, under £25 million. So it's not all about the cost, but we do have an obligation in Manx Utilities to deliver the best value for our customers. So we we couldn't, with with all good conscience, say it was worth spending an additional uh, £15 million on that site. So with the site that you've sort of selected then, is it hoped that you can kind of get the turbines there without having to massively build new roads and things like that? Yes. So um, initially, when we started looking at the site, we thought that we were going to have to do what's called a beach landing at Castletown Beach. So that involves a barge coming up, unloading the turbines straight onto the beach, and the turbines would then get delivered up to the site via Castletown. And that doesn't mean you're building infrastructure. Um, There's a lot of claims going uh, around that we were going to build a new harbour in Castletown. That's absolutely never been the case. But more recently, we were always optimistic that we were going to be able to deliver them from Douglas and we have now got more confidence in being able to use that route so our preferred route is to come down from Douglas and utilise the new Balasala bypass as it should be built by 2026 and then deliver them that way without any impact to the residents of Castletown. So going forward now we've said that this is the site that's going to be progressed what happens now in terms of the different various surveys and and the work that goes now goes forward? Yeah so there there are 12 different specialist areas and we've got a list of all of those on our website. The key ones that are taking place at the moment are the wind monitoring and that records accurate measured wind speeds at the site and that's that's really important for the design of the turbines. We knew what the average wind speeds were likely to be for that site and, and it is it's got fantastic potential which is really good in terms of the energy production from that site but the importance in terms of the design is capturing the very very high wind speeds that you you do get and to date the highest wind speed we've recorded is 35 meters per second which is significant so um, it it didn't last very long but in terms of a design you would want your wind turbine to be able to withstand those very very high wind speeds. The next stage that's also happening is the noise monitoring and that's to make sure that the noise levels uh, felt by the residents at that site is well below what is normal human hearing level. So 
making sure that nobody in the local area is adversely impacted. And that, that's a key thing. We have to work with those stakeholders and, and we will be working with those stakeholders going forwards. The other things that are taking place are our bird and bat surveys. So they have to last 18 months, which is why we had to start very early into that process. Um, and all of that information is going to help us um, develop what's called a scoping report. So we submit a report of what we know to be true at this point in time and also what surveys are going to involve going forward the methodology for those surveys and that is open to all of the local experts to comment on um, and express their views make sure that they're satisfied that we're going to be doing enough to capture um, what they need to see Um, and it's really important that we thoroughly review the impact on every aspect of that site um, and considering all issues. Because if we find an impact, it d- doesn't necessarily mean it stops the project going ahead, but it does mean we have to do additional steps to mitigate that that impact. So um, that, that's really the importance going forwards. And that scoping report then, where does that go? Does that get submitted to Timwald for approval? Is that just goes out to the different experts? Where, where does that ultimately go? It's actually part of the planning process. So it goes to uh, initially the environmental stakeholders. Um, so the, the the groups like you have Mild, Manx Wildlife Trust, mm-hmm. um, Manx Bird Life, certainly part of one of the, the key consultees in that process. And it's actually quite difficult for us because in an ideal world, we would have already started consulting these stakeholders and involving them as much as we possibly could to get their expertise into our project early on but the problem we then have is they're then conflicted for providing impartial advice on and making sure that we're doing the right thing so they're involved they will be involved but at this point in time we're we're trying to avoid compromising them to make sure that they do give a really really robust challenge to our process And, and I think that's better for everyone. And do you think that there's misconceptions then about the process of this because I mean we've never had an onshore wind farm here in the Isle of Man in the UK it's you know there's there's plenty of them but this is the process that you kind of have to follow and um you know the steps are being done in the right order yeah so um before we even got to the stage there was a robust course screening process that that was done and um, we've since had an audit done to make sure that we're uh, targeting the right site locations um we then have to go through an initial feasibility study to make sure that sites are viable and, and as we've discussed already two of those sites are not viable um we then have to go through a rigorous process involving additional surveys um, to the environmental impact assessment, as it's called, or, or EIA, sometimes referred to. Um, we have to do a, a robust design process. Um, and because we know that the lead times for wind turbines are, are, are very long, at the, at the moment our understanding is they're between one and two years, um, we have to engage with the manufacturers very, very early into this process to make sure we can secure a booking um, ahead of the wind farm being built. Um, so that's the sort of conversations we're having at the moment. Are you confident that now, if, if there's not any major issues flagged in this next process, that we actually will see this site you know, maybe be completed? I think um, confidence is, is, is a really difficult question because until we've actually completed the surveys, we absolutely cannot say that it's deliverable. Um, and the, the clearest example of an issue that could come up is when we start doing the geotechnical surveys and do some boreholes later into the study, we could, and it is very unlikely, find something like a Roman villa, at which point you have found something so significant in terms of the heritage and culture of our, our Isle of Man and our understanding of Manx history today that you wouldn't go ahead with the project because but I suppose the positive of that is you found something that's so significant that it could be a massive benefit to the island so that's the sort of thing from uh, that, that could uh, stop the project going ahead but um, in terms of the technical deliverability everything that we know to date says the project can happen and um, we will have to fully understand impacts and, and look to mitigate them um, and, and progress with those so one one of the things we have to ensure is that we get um, positive net biodiversity gain from the project and actually leave the land in a better state than when we found it Um, but that's entirely why we're going through this environmental impact assessment process. Obviously the onshore wind isn't the only thing being progressed we've seen a lot of solar projects have we got any updates on where that's at at the minute? Yes so um, we're currently uh, looking to start our Uh, structural and electrical designs so for any renewable project of this scale to go ahead it's really really important you understand the impact of the network so so that's where we're going Um, if we look at buildings like the NSC we want to make sure that the roof is structurally sound um, which we're 
confident that we can accommodate them on on the roof, but you don't know what design you would need to put in place to enable that process to take place. Um, So those are the sorts of um, things we're thinking about at the moment. Um, We're also looking for areas where there are opportunities to increase the level of public solar. Um, One of the discussions we've had recently um, is related to the new Edward VIII Pier. So they're putting in a walkway down um, to connect to the Manxman and it's going to be suitable for solar panels. So that could be the very first um, project we start to see on the island. Is there anything else you want to add at all? Um, I think there is a lot of misinformation out there and there's a lot of worry and people are looking at that misinformation and starting to worry. So if anyone is worried, um, they can come and ask our Manx Utilities transition team any questions that they have. We have a dedicated email address set up and a lot of the misconceptions can be addressed by that process. So I've already mentioned the Castle Town Harbour um, misconception. There's another one that we don't understand where has come from related to we're going to expand a quarry um, in the area. Nothing to do with us and uh, not, not part of the project. Um, there's another misconception about accessing the site. Manx Utilities owns the land next to the slock and the party next to us who owns land next to the slock is is DEFA. So we can access the site without utilising anyone's uh, private land for, for development if we need to. Um, but there are a lot of other uh, misconceptions out there. So, so please, if you're worried, email our team and we'll be happy to talk through them with you. Thank you for making it to the end of the Little Manx Radio newscast. You are obviously someone with exquisite taste. May I politely suggest you might want to subscribe to this and a wide range of Manx Radio podcasts at your favourite podcast provider so our best bits will magically appear on your smartphone. Thank you. Thank you.